sorry that we're running late, but we'll, um, we'll make it worth your while. Um, my name is Rose Jacobs. I'm a lecturer in the Sprachen Centrum, and um, I'm delighted to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, Dr. Dr. Professor Friedel, Winter Friedel, not only runs a growing and internationally acclaimed school of management here at the TEU, he's also a prolific writer and his textbook on cost management has won several awards. So we might come to him when it comes to writing for students, writing about science for students, but he has plenty to say on other matters as well. He also teaches a course where he bravely gets uh, students to write case studies on, on business cases. So we'll have, I imagine, something to say on uh, students writing in a second language or even in their first language. Um, Professor Klaus Diepold has long been uh, interested in languages. As a school kid, he wanted to learn ten. He settled on being fluent in three. And uh, the reason for that is that he got distracted by music. He's a piano player and also by electrical engineering. He is now a professor of electrical engineering and teaches a course on writing English to his electrical engineering students. He did that when he realized that he was correcting piles and piles and piles of doctoral theses and thought maybe I should get to the root of the problem first. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Finley is in the physics department up in Garfin. He, uh, at very least, writes good headlines. His courses have good titles. He's teaching a class this semester on current topics in nanophysics, what's hot and what's not. Uh, he hails from York, so if you guys aren't careful, he and I might go down the rabbit hole of British versus American English. Watch out. And Leslie Sage, many of you will have met earlier. He was our keynote speaker. He's a editor at Nature, and um, he may well help you get published at some point, or more likely not. I'm afraid Nature rejects 7%. Um, or only accepts 7% of all papers submitted. Um, Dr. Sage said earlier that uh, you don't need to worry too much about your writing because if your science is good, they will fix the writing at nature. But he also said writing is important because it helps you do your science. And so that's where I wanted to start the conversation. Um, Dr. Finley, I wanted to know when you start writing. Is it um, at the beginning of your research process or only once you wrap up all the theory and experience? So good evening. Yeah. So I mean, I would. I think it's quite clear that in, certainly in my faculty in physics, the writing process is a kind of like organic thing. You start at the very beginning. So as soon as you have, it starts with the proposal, and the best way to develop good ideas is to sit down and to start to write them down, see how they link together. So the writing there is absolutely something which starts at the beginning. And writing for me personally is something which you have to do because it helps you dump your thoughts into the word processor onto a piece of paper, arrange them, uh, see what links to what, see what the context is of the research that you're planning to do or thinking about. So all of those things are absolutely crucial to me. And uh, the research is not just done in the lab, it's absolutely done uh, on paper during the writing process as well. And I think, uh, I guess it's similar in many of the other faculties that we're going to hear about, but uh, this is a, a common theme. Uh, but maybe touch on this a bit later on, it's also something where it's quite often difficult to convince students that that's exactly the way that they should go about their own research. You know, many, let's say, uh, these days it's better, as you'll know, there's, there used to be the diploma, the physics diploma, and now there's bachelor and master, and it means in the bachelor thesis, they already in semester number six, so after spending a little less than three years at the university, in the physics department, they have to already sit down and write a thesis, a three-month research, and they have to write a, a thesis. And that's typically the first time these students have been confronted with the task of writing, making scientific writing and developing an argument. And I see every single year with almost every student the same problem. They do their research in the lab, they come back, they have four weeks left, and they have to write it down. And some of them, as you know, they, they agonize about every sentence, every paragraph, and every page, and they don't tell you, if you ask, how's it going, oh, it's fine. Uh, and then one week before the deadline, you say, how's it going? Oh, it's fine, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and then a day before the deadline, how's it going? Oh, I need an extension. Yeah. 
And at that point is when they first give you something and you realize they're having a real problem putting their ideas, structuring and putting it down on paper. So this is why I think personally that uh, the earlier students engage with writing science and learning that by writing about it you're doing research and by writing about it, developing your ideas, you're giving yourself inspiration and ideas for what you should go back in the lab and do in the next phase of your research. So to answer, a long answer to a very short question would be that it's, uh, it's essential and it should be something that accompanies the whole research process rather than being something which is done at the end when the thing is completed and boxed off. Yeah. Uh, Professor Diefel, when we were speaking earlier you compared um, writing a scientific paper with telling a good joke and, uh, and maybe you can elaborate on that for the audience. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the story goes that when you read papers and, and articles and um, you want to appreciate the story, so you, you reflect on what you're reading and what are the things that most trigger you most and keep your appetite to read it and, and keep you engaged. And then you should say, well, it's, it's maybe mostly the ideas. Ideas, they should be sparking and they should be standing in front of the story and make it interesting to read on. And um, so, and the story with the, with the joke is that, okay, if you are writing, make sure that your ideas that you had originally are clearly visible and are sparkling like stars. Problem is, it's like the punchline of the joke. So the punch, if you miss, if you screw up the punchline, the whole joke is gone. So, uh, so if you can't really make your ideas shine, then your paper is, you lost an opportunity. And the point is that I use this argument and this type of thinking to say to students get started early on because when you start early on, the only thing you have to write about is, this, is your ideas. So you, you can write about your ideas and you can spend some time on explaining your ideas and then uh, later on you already have, already have some version of your ideas on paper. Because when you get to the end of your thesis project, for instance, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that is filling up your brain and that is basically filling you up and then you would like to share your blood and your suffering and everything with the audience because all the details that are so painful and the only thing that comes to your mind is writing all the details of the blood and you have to pay for it you can see dripping. <laughs> and that's the boring part, nobody wants to know the, the blood, sweat and tears. But if you, if at that stage you want to write about your ideas, you think, oh, they were so minuscule or so it's not really worthwhile talking about it because after all this time they appear to be evident and clear. There's nothing to say about the ideas anymore. This is why I said, okay, write your ideas at the beginning of the story because then they will be crisp and fresh and, and, and otherwise you will be drowning your ideas in blood, sweat and tears and then you're ruining the punchline of your joke. And that's, that's the story behind it. Is it, yeah, we talk a lot about making sure that the audience gets to know the process, but it's not, it's not the process, the blood, sweat, and tears process, it's the progression of the ideas, how the idea grows, I suppose. Yeah. As Jonathan said, it's, it's also a, a mechanism to help you organize your research work, and, uh, and that's certainly something that students have an extreme hard time to appreciate and to embrace as an opportunity. So you have, and if you see this in the last minute, or the last day before submitting the thesis, then it's mostly too late. So it's hard to fix it. Then they have a, a dent in your soul for the next one. Oh, not again, writing a thesis. Oh, it gets even worse. So that's probably the story about it. Okay. And um, Dr. Friedel, do you find that it's difficult to persuade business school students as well to start writing early? Or is it important, do you think? Yeah, so I very much agree with uh, what uh, Jonathan Finley said about uh, when to start writing. It must be as early as possible and I think that is one of the biggest mistakes that uh, many of our students make in particular. Um, and and uh, the, the uh, further they are uh, within their academic career, so uh, the, the, the later they usually start. Um, uh, when you have uh, a bachelor student, then he knows he has only three months, so he um, would then start at least after two months, I would say, uh, for uh, the master thesis, you have the six months, so uh, you tend to wait for four months, and for the doctoral di uh, dissertation, uh, you know that you have uh, three to five or even more uh, time, and then you uh, 
you, you read a lot and you um, ask questions and you think about topics and you do analysis, but you don't write. And, uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes. I would also uh, say that you, you, we need to encourage our uh, students at all levels to start writing as uh, as early as uh, as uh, possible and. Uh, in particular, the, I mean, the writing process usually helps you to get your ideas much clearer than if you don't write. Mm -hmm. uh, you read something, then you have an idea, and you think that you have thought through the idea, uh, but you, uh, you you realize that you haven't um, when you start writing, because then uh, the, the, the whole pain uh, usually begins. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious because two of you at least are, are often writing in English, which is your second language. And I wonder, when you, when you write early in the scientific process, as a way of thinking through your ideas more concretely, do you write in English or do you write in German? Yeah, so it so, uh, depends, uh, I would say. Uh, when I do uh, research, then I usually start writing in English, um, uh, which is clear. But we also, uh, also as, you, as you mentioned, I write textbooks, and these textbooks, uh, at least for a long time, have been in German, uh, then I write in German. But what I uh, usually never do is to write in German and then translate what I have written into, uh, into English. So uh, it's basically uh, the question what the uh, final text will be, and that's the language I, uh, I will start with. Yeah. Same with me, I would say once I'm in a research mode, I'm always thinking and writing in English. I hardly ever write anything that's in German. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really think of anything that I'm writing in German these days, so it's mostly English to start with. So, so I have the other side of the coin, I'm a, a native speaker, and when I have to write something in German, what I do is I, I give it to my secretary and she says oh, it's all far too polite. <laughs> because it, it turns out uh, I, I, I'm far too polite when I formulate things in German and I'm not sufficiently direct when I write things in German. And it took me really a long time, I've been here a while now, but it took me three years after arriving in Munich to, to realize if I don't really say what I want directly to my colleagues, I don't get anything. <laughs> uh, and it's absolutely essential to have this direct speech. And in the UK or in Great Britain, the direct speech that I use in German would be absolutely rude. My colleagues would abandon me and never speak to me again. Yeah? But in, in, in here, I'm still polite when I'm using that direct speech. <laughs> but do you think that perhaps that experience has improved your English writing as well? I mean, Leslie, I, I don't know if you agree, but I often encourage people to try to be more direct in their writing. Maybe German helps English writers uh, stop coughing and <clears throat> before they get to the point. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I always encourage people to be uh, direct and clear and don't beat around the bush. Um, one of the things that annoys me the most is, uh, with the writing that I see is that people do try to be too indirect and, and if, they, if they're critical of previous research, um, you know, say, there was this problem with this earlier paper, and we fixed it. You know, don't, don't mess around and say, well, you know, they did a really nice job. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, uh, for the process of writing, one of the things that I found to be most important is um, set yourself a goal every day, you know, you're going to write a thousand words, or two thousand words, or whatever your goal is. And it doesn't matter if it's all bad, and you delete most of it the following day or the next week. Uh, just start getting those thoughts down on paper. That's really, really important when it comes to a thesis. And, and you have to be writing every single day. Maybe if I may, so... I, related to this point, I have, a, I have a, an excellent student at the moment who shall remain entirely nameless, uh, who is uh, really uh, academically extremely bright at the top of his game. Uh, and he's been writing a paper now for close to 10 months. And it's been the same story. Okay, uh, yeah, it's nearly done. I need to change the figures and then you'll get the first draft. And eventually it came to a confrontation where I would say, look, what's happening with this manuscript? We need to publish this manuscript. And I sat down with him and forced him to show me you know, 
know, where he got to with the manuscript. And uh, it turned out that uh, he was, he'd done a fairly okay job, but he was agonizing so much about the way he formulated it and the way he put it together that he wasn't getting things down on paper, as Leslie was saying just now. Uh, and I, I said to him, look, it doesn't matter if the English is not perfect. It doesn't matter if there's some arguments or didactic constructions which are not maybe the perfect ones. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to have something to work with, and then you can cut and paste and move things around and sharpen the arguments. And it's this process of, let's say, iteratively sort of editing the manuscript and developing the arguments, maybe doing some more experiments and coming back. This is what, I think we started the discussion with this organic evolution of the way uh, research actually takes place. And I said to him, we finished the manuscript in the end, you'll be happy to know. And I said to him, okay, the next one, I said, oh, we need to write the other paper now. And you could see the look in his face, oh my God, I've got it again now. But I'm hoping that he'll build on this experience. I, I, what, what I wanted to say was, I think a lot of the time, uh, very good and very academically bright students, they're used to having everything they do being excellent. Yeah? And it's sometimes very difficult for them when they're feeling a little less sure to give their mentor or their supervisor the work that they've done because they're not satisfied with it. It's not as excellent as they imagined it would be and they're only used to having very positive feedback from their teachers or mentors or lecturers. And I, I think this is a barrier that needs to be broken down at the right at the beginning for many students to say, look, we're doing this together. It's not that you're going to give it me, I'm going to say, oh, it's a beautiful paper, uh, submit it to nature. You know? <laughs> they all know that we will take it and we'll rewrite most of it. And that then, uh, if you've seen the, 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 the comic, PhD comics, which is online, it's all true. Yeah? This is what happens with most of these uh, grad students' attempts at writing scientific uh, reports and scientific papers. And, this is a, you know, I, so now I say to all my guys, it doesn't matter at all whether you're entirely happy with it, just make a version in a week, give it me and we'll work, and then I'll give it you back and you'll make it even better. I think it's important, uh, this, uh, like, getting rid of the urge of uh, perfection. And uh, I tell the students that there's always a big laugh at the class, so, well, you have to allow yourself to, to commit to a shitty first draft. Yes. So make all your thoughts into it and don't worry about the English language, if it's right or wrong, if you crossed all the T's and dotted the I's, just get it down and then we'll work on it, just exactly. But just coming back to your the thing about the routine, writing daily, that is certainly one prescription I also give students. said, well, you should be writing daily and I don't care if you measure your daily writing in pages or in words or whatever, just get used to it to write every day something. It doesn't really do much what you're writing. And then students just look and stare at you and say, well, that's cheap. I said, okay, we make an experiment. And I, I have this as part of my course. I said, okay, have an experiment for one week. You will be asked to observe your morning routine. After, after you walk, open up your eyes in the morning, what are you doing? What's the typical routine that you're going through? Are you getting up and starting the coffee machine and then go back to the shower and do you brush the teeth after the shower and, and so on and so forth until you leave the house? And you will see probably that you have a certain routine that you follow. And you can, you can even break it down to you going into the shower. How do you start? From top to bottom, bottom to bottom? <laughs> how, so observe. And you will find out this certain routine. First, first week, that's it. This is cheap again. Say, okay, now next. The next one is take your morning routine and change one thing for a complete week. Have the coffee before the shower instead of the other way around. Or it doesn't matter what. And I, I will tell you how it works work out. The first day you change and you say, that was a piece of cake. Second day you say, ah, that's not so hard, I can do it. The third day, just as you sit in the train to work, ah, I forgot, I have to change this one thing. You do it one more time on Thursday, on Friday it's out of your mind. Once you come back on Monday, you ask, how did I do? Oh, oh yeah, it's exactly how you said. Monday, Tuesday was okay, Wednesday was a drop, Thursday return, and then it was gone. I said, okay, and that's exactly the difficulty. We have so many habits, and changing a habit is extremely complicated. And if you only have the habit to write at the end of your work, you have to change it to daily writing, that's a daily fight in the beginning before it becomes second nature. 
And that's, that's why we, I told the students in the semester, show me your, one, your daily writings. You mean this seriously? Say, yes, show it to me. Do you have a piece of paper typed up, printed, or handwritten? I don't care, show it to me. And that's just a, to get into the routine of writing daily. Painful that process, I can tell you. Even though we, I don't even read, write the, con read the content of the writing. <laughs> just filling the paper. It's bad enough. It's the opposite to me that we're burdened by bad habits, but also sometimes by very romantic notions of writing. Your students, while they would completely accept that um, they can make mistakes in the lab and that's part of the process, or that they work with others in the lab, they might have this idea that they sit down and write the piece of, uh, you know, the piece of, write up their piece of research without any help from anyone, and they feel like a failure if they get edited. Um, those of us who write professionally know that it's a collaborative process. Is that something that your students or even yourselves have trouble grasping? So this is one of the things that I had to get over when I uh, first joined Nature. And I thought I wrote pretty well. And, uh, but we work at Nature under close supervision for the first couple of years. And so somebody was always looking at my letters to, to authors and saying, well, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. You have to change this. And it took me about three months before I got over the the sort of resentment that, that my writing wasn't perfect. So, you know, I've experienced this directly. It, it, it does make me um, more sensitive when I'm dealing with, uh, with authors. It, it's actually better dealing with graduate students, especially if it's their first paper, their first or second paper, because uh, then they they know that it's not good. And they, they can show it to me. And, and then, you know, we can work back and forth. But, you know, if I have somebody who's been a professor for 10 years and the paper is terrible, then they're much more resistant to changes than, uh, than the graduate students. Hmm. <laughs> I've never thought of this. <laughs> I think, I think some of this is related to the fact that the, the paper or the manuscript is seen as the end product of a piece of research by many students and they don't have this flavor of uh, part of the research rather than the thing which comes at the end of the research. You know? mm -hmm. And I suppose um, even a perfect paper published in Nature is only part of the wider conversation yep. in the scientific community. Which brings me to my next question which is I'm curious to know if, if publication, publishing in science is about a conversation with your fellow scientists. What's your audience? Is it very specialized? Is it a bit broader? Who do you write for when you write? <laughs> um, when, when publishing research, you basically write for the journal. You, you have a target journal in mind, and you, um, you, you have to be aware of the fact, uh, at least in, uh, in management, that uh, most papers um, are not really read by many more, by much more um, uh, researchers than the uh, referees, and some um, uh, uh, just a handful of, uh, of readers. So um, the question that uh, we need to answer uh, uh, is uh, basically how to uh, translate our research to the uh, to a more general, uh, more broader audience. We have a very intensive de debate right now in the management profession. Uh, whether management professors really uh, have an impact on uh, their, uh, their profession. And um, uh, this uh, impact right now is measured by the number of uh, counts. Uh, uh, the article is cited in uh, other uh, journals, uh, but we uh, right now broaden that much more. For example, at our uh, department, uh, at the Tom School of Management, we have now uh, included a new section that is called Management Insights. And we urge our professors to uh, to write uh, short uh, wrap-ups of their uh, recent research that translates this research to a broader audience. And we haven't too much experience right now how uh, well this is perceived by the, uh, by the uh, practice community, but we are totally aware of the fact that uh, what we write uh, in our research is for a very specific audience that is not, and uh, we, we do not manage to uh, give this part of papers to a broader 
uh, audience that we want to target with uh, our results. And a follow-up question on that. This is maybe a crazy question, but is it kind of fun to write for a broader, broader audience, or do you find it very difficult? <laughs> um, they're, they're very good. I mean, the, 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 First question is basically, uh, is, it, is it fun to write? Um, and um, uh, if, if you ask me, I would say, I uh, really have to force myself to sit down and write. So uh, for me, it's not fun, at least not when, uh, before I start writing. When I am in the writing process and when I have seen that there is a piece of paper, there's a uh, page of uh, paper that is filled up with words and I read that and it's uh, okay, then. I'm quite proud of that, so it's like uh, going for a run. Uh, you, uh, I, I always have to uh, force myself to go out, uh, but once I've done that, I'm really happy that I have done that. So uh, I hope that there are much more uh, people outside that, uh, that, that really have fun with writing. Uh, for me, it's not uh, necessarily the case. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> And I usually tell students, so if anybody tells you that writing is fun, then be very cautious. <laughs> and um, I have friends of mine who live by writing novels and books, and I have this lady, she's writing novel, uh, mystery books, and she tells me about her writing and how painful it is for her. And, uh, and I say, okay, you do this for a living, so every couple of months you have to cuff up with some mystery novel. I said, yeah, uh, it's, it's painful. I said, okay. So I think I'm very happy to see that she's also suffering of all the novels. And I think most people, just as you are, are, kind of suffering from the same thing. And once you're in the process, maybe it feels not so painful. And there's always some search for methodologies. How can I make this in a Schweinehund? How can I, how can I battle it? Get, get earlier to my daily writing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a struggle also. So I would also uh, agree with everything that's been said, but uh, uh, I'm not really a runner. But uh, on the other side, on the other hand, uh, I do sometimes enjoy writing. Uh, I find that uh, with myself, I have the zone. Yeah, you, you know about the zone. And sometimes I get in the zone. When I'm in the zone, I want to write, and I sit there and I write and I write and I can sit for several hours and do it. And I leave, I leave the the office and go home and think, okay, I had a great run today. I feel healthier than I did this morning. The next day I come in and read what I wrote and think it's garbage. Oh my god, it's absolutely rubbish. Uh, and I think this, there's this kind of waves of creativity and waves of, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, 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 it's in a way a kind of a, it's not a split personality, but I have to get in a certain frame of mind to write a certain target text. If I'm writing a journal article, it might be some different frame of mind than if I'm writing a proposal because my audience is different, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to persuade people this is viable and the context is important and you should value this. And sometimes when I'm writing a journal article, I don't care about that. What I'm interested in is persuading people this is beautiful science, what I'm doing. Look how fantastic this is. And it's the beauty rather than the function, so to speak. Yeah. And this is uh, what I mean by sometimes you have different, uh, let's say, a different personality and you have to be able to get into these different personalities to do different jobs. Yeah, and some days I really hate to write. Some days I, I just sit there and hate it. Yeah, but uh, some days I also, one day I will run again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, some days I don't like to write, but I have to. I'm a columnist, and so, you know, I have a deadline. And, um, for example, Oops. Yeah. Some of you might have heard on, on the news last night about the supernovae that went off near Earth a couple of million years ago. So my next column is about that topic. And I was really interested in the topic and I really liked the papers, but that was a really hard column for me to write. And I just had to force myself to do it because I had a deadline. Rose knows all about deadlines. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that can be right. <laughs> um, I realize that maybe we've gotten ahead of ourselves in some ways. Um, this is a panel about good writing, and we haven't defined it. I was wondering if maybe 
each of you can talk about the last time you read something where, in your field, or near your field, where the writing stood out for being good, or, I suppose, being really bad. Well, maybe I have the mic, so I'll start, but I'll... <laughs> so really bad there are. We, we could be here for an hour or so, for many hours. But really good, I, I think in some ways, I don't really read a paper and think the writing in that paper is really good. I, I read a paper and think this is fantastic science. And that normally sometimes means that the writing is good because the author has managed to formulate it and construct it in a way which made it very clear. And that brings the science to the front. Uh, I kind of, uh, I'm kind of a bit stuck because I would have to go back and look at those very good scientific papers and see if they have the same style and the same kind of common thread. But I mean there are papers we all know, there are papers uh, in all areas of science and academia which are badly written, there are the obvious rules. My, my personal hate in physics papers is when people, they have data that they show and they typically have plots or graphs and they refer to these graphs in a passive way. And I don't mean in the passive voice, I mean they'll discuss some complicated science and then put in brackets at the end, figure two. Yeah? <laughs> and that is not the right way to write a good scientific article. I think a good way is to take the reader by the hand and make her or him see what you see and to, for them, to allow them to come to the same conclusion that you came to. And then they kind of think to themselves, hey, I thought of that. Yeah? This guy's going to tell me now that this is true, but I only thought of that just by looking at the data because he or she, the writer, did such a good job of presenting the case for the science that you came to the same conclusion yourself. And I think this is a kind of way, in a, in a way, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, in a way, good writing is kind of like, it's, it's taking the reader by the hand and leading them through the arguments and allowing them to conclude that. And uh, when they've done that, of course, they have the same train of thinking as you had when writing it, and because of that they can maybe see a little bit further and make the next step, which you didn't even think about yet. And that's the way science works. It's allowing people to think the same way that you thought and to maybe come up with some new idea. Um, what, what, I have, um, there are two types of um, papers usually that um, I um, that, uh, I uh, allowed to read um, at least um, at the I would say low, lower levels in, um, in research and um, one of uh, these papers uh, basically is based on uh, not a question but rather a topic so you write about a certain topic and always when you write about a topic then one of the danger uh, the danger is that you write about the topic but you do not really answer a question so the reader usually is um, a bit, uh, it, it's difficult to follow for for the reader what really is uh, what, what is what really is happening uh, within the paper, and um, this is one of the um, these are usually the papers that uh, at least for me are difficult to follow. And I think the good papers are those who ask um, meaningful questions, and it is entirely clear that there is a question at the beginning and. Uh, the, the reader is led through the answer uh, of the question. So, for example, we have uh, um, we have um, we have topics that we usually present in our master thesis that had, uh, had, had titles like um, managing innovation in a digital uh, uh, enterprise, and um, you, uh, you you give that as a topic to the student, and then they write about uh, what is management, what is digital in a way, a digital, a digital enterprise, and uh, they do not really answer a question. And uh, what we need to uh, to do is to uh, make them um, aware of the fact that readers want to know which questions have been asked and how they have been answered. And if you um, use that as a principal uh, guideline, then your writing is usually much better than the other, uh, in the, the, the other type of uh, papers. I was just thinking about it, you know, okay, when you go to high school and you learn writing in your native language, then you get some hints about how to compose a story that you're telling about building up some climax and then you 
you resolve the whole story. There's a certain dynamics that you are taught for composing fiction or whatever kind of a story. However, we are kind of lacking a similar guidelines for writing scientific papers, making them worthwhile to it, giving them a role to their own dynamics. Maybe they have different drama dramaturgy than, than, uh, than a story to tell. And still I think that in a, a story, a book or a, a text that you like to read has a storytelling element to it. It also builds up maybe some tension, maybe some questions, some release, and it guides you through the story. And you as a reader, you feel engaged into following the stories and maybe even some traps in between here and there. So you could also make it engaging and, and, and thrilling to some extent to explore the thoughts of the, of the reader, of the writer, sorry. And if I think about a role model for, for the writing in my field, well, I'm an electric engineer, but um, I'm more on the computer engineering part, so I'm pushing bits around. So, so there is one, one guy, Donald Knut uh, from Stanford, and he has been writing books about heavy-duty computer science stuff. It's, not, it's far from being simple, it's far from being easy and trivial, it's some of the most elaborate stuff you can possibly read. And the books are three volumes, The Art of Computer Programming 1, 2, 3, and if you would like to press flowers, you should buy those books, they're heavy and thick, but they're absolutely fabulous to read. And you just, it's like a novel, you start like a page turner, you read them and you will be led into some depth of computer science you would not have been thought be able to follow because the story, how it is told, the thoughts, how they develop is very thoughtfully done. It's, it's storytelling. And if I really want to have some high-class scientific text to read, I always recommend the students to pick up some story, some books, or in particular those books by Don Knut. Absolute fabulous. And uh, I can and writing, reading papers. I, I really can't remember that I read a similar high-class paper in my day. I'm just reviewing papers for a conference. I, as you said, I could easily come up with bad papers most of the time. <laughs> so I see a lot of bad papers. <laughs> um, but the, as I said this morning, the, uh, the, the, worst, the worst ones I've ever seen were from native English speakers at Oxford. And uh, they, they just wanted to try and impress people with how smart they were. And uh, I do see the occasional good paper. And good papers are clear, direct, and uh, as simple as the topic allows. And, uh, but a lot of my job is to take a bad paper and turn it into a good one. So, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't mind working with bad papers as long as the science is good. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get to that process, taking bad papers and turning them into good ones. I was relieved to hear Jonathan Finlay use this image of taking the reader by the hand through the story because when I sit in the writing center, I often feel like I'm asking students to take me by the hand and talk me through their science. And I wonder um, how we as writing instructors and language teachers can help you teach the students to write better. <laughs> I think I'm gonna pass the microphone. <laughs> But before I do, let me make just one very short yeah. comment. Uh, I, I, I absolutely believe that uh, there is a serious need for intervention. Uh, and I mean intervention in a kind of helpful way for students. I think creative, scientific, academic writing is not taught sufficiently early. It's the cornerstone of everything that we do in the university. Okay, students come and they learn about my faculty physics, I hope. Uh, but they don't learn how to do physics, they learn about physics. And then they only start to do physics when they do research. They go in the lab or they sit with a pencil and a piece of paper as a theoretician and do some calculations. That's when they do the physics. Before that, they're sitting in a passive way, mostly in a lecture room, 
listening to somebody who does physics talk about physics. Yeah? And uh, I think personally, to allow our people to, our students to discover and have that eureka moment early enough, uh, they should be taught academic writing from semester two. You know, they should get it at the beginning of their studies and they should have this ethos built into them that it's a dynamic organic process from the beginning. And I think it doesn't happen at the moment, unfortunately. But I'm afraid this particular part of the story can't be accomplished by the English teachers. That's, that's basically the role call up for us, responsible for designing the curricula and the study programs in the first place. So I, I fully agree. So and I like this picture that students most of the time learn, they, in the best case, they can watch other people do science and not really experiencing science, science them, themselves. Um, how to teach? Well, I think uh, we mentioned a couple of things, and I think the, the, the working part of it. Making students understand that writing is a process, and it's never finishing. It is never about to start. It's like continuously a process, and you can be as imperfect as you want with a shitty first draft and basically getting rid of the notion that, uh, that they have to be perfect or they, this is something they could avoid. This is another thing. I have one experience that tells me a little bit how far away most of the students are from writing process itself. So usually when I give out a bachelor thesis topic, the students are requested to come back with a project plan two weeks into the thesis work. And the idea is to say, okay, to explain to me a couple of cornerstones and how they plan their work and so on. And at the end, I also ask them to give a little time uh, schedule of what, how, they, how do you envision the things to run, like a Gantt chart. And usually they have like this wonderful Gantt chart with all their blocks and subtasks. And the last task at the bottom is writing. And then and, and I look at the plan and then they start counting the, the point. Well, one block means two weeks. So you have two blocks. This is four, two weeks, four weeks of writing. Okay, and then my question is, how did you estimate this? How did you calculate the number of time, the time you need for writing? And then the usual 99% of time is the... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, 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 okay. Uh, how long do you think a thesis, a bachelor thesis is supposed to be? Um, <laughs> Okay, we agree on somewhere between 40 and 60 pages. Okay, good. So how much pages do you think you can produce net, in a net fashion, within one day? <laughs> so if you take your 60 pages and divide it by the number of times they have planned for it, so you have to be highly productive to get even close to you getting your thesis done. Have you ever made some measurements? <laughs> So the point is, I'm trying to make is the process. It, it demonstrates they're completely clueless, and they have no means to estimate their productivity in writing. And that could be something to say, okay, start measuring your writing product productivity. So I usually say to the students, okay, now you write a book, a diary every day, and you just take notes of how much you spend work time on something, and in particular on writing. And when you're done at the end of your thesis, you submit it, you can't you add up all your hours that you spend writing, and then you do a simple calculation, number of pages divided by time. And it gives you a productivity either by the hour or by the day, and then you can, you can be very happy to come up with three pages a day. That's pretty good, maybe it's lower. But you should use those figures for the next writing assignment and see if you get better or if you get any worse. And just getting a feel for the complexity of writing, getting a, a feel for the process behind. I think that's sometimes even as important or maybe more important than being always grammatically correct. And in, I don't know how this works in the English language, but in German language we're basically beat, beaten up by just being grammatically correct. You can be as stupid in your statement as you want, but it has to be grammatically correct. Which I thought is completely useless for all my writing that I have to do on a daily basis. So, the process is more important than the grammatical correctness. And even word can help you at times. Software can help you. But the process, software can't help you. So, maybe that's something to be. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, 
not sure whether I can contribute to the original question, uh, but, but uh, based on what you said, uh, Klaus, uh, we, we um, uh, in our curriculum, uh, in our uh, uh, in our bachelor program, management and technology, we uh, force our students uh, obviously to write a bachelor thesis uh, at the end of their studies, the three month thesis. And they usually have another option to write something, which is a seminar, which is typically which typically takes place in the fourth or fifth term of their studies. And um, what we found out is that uh, those students who um, have a seminar where they are forced to write something, this is not in each seminar the case, uh, um, these usually perform better in their bachelor thesis than those who didn't uh, do that before, which uh, which uh, entirely speaks for changes in the curriculum to force students to write as early as possible. I mean, uh, one of the impediments is that we have uh, a lot of students in the undergraduate programs, we typically have 500 students and uh, there are only limited uh, resources to, uh, uh, to uh, basically uh, read all what our students have uh, written and uh, if you don't read what they have written then the question is whether, uh, whether it uh, is of uh, any use. But I think uh, uh, we, we should uh, deviate a bit from that. We should start, we should definitely start um, writing earlier, forcing our students to write early because that improves their writing in their later stages and that basically goes back to that uh, what uh, uh, Jonathan Finley uh, said in the, in the beginning it's a process and you must start this process as early as possible so uh, it, this is true not only for the uh, time of the bachelor thesis itself for the three months it's also true for the three years of studies uh, in, the, in the entire uh, 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 and, and, uh, in, in a way we yeah. reinforce this idea that the bachelor thesis is the end of the bachelor study right. it's the thing you do at the end the master thesis is the thing you do at the end, and it's, it kind of a little bit reinforces exactly this thing which I've been arguing is, a, is not a good thing. I think at this stage I would love to open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, maybe raise your hands and we'll bring the microphone around. Um, can a thesis be good if you're not interested in the topic? Mm -hmm. Can a thesis be good if you're not interested in the topic, That's if the writer is not interested? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I think it can be the case also in, in my faculty that students set out on a topic and they realize after a while that either they're going to get a null result or it's something where they lose interest in the topic. Yeah, it doesn't capture their, their soul in a way. And I think this can happen, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's very, very difficult. I think in that case, the best way is to say, okay, the student should feel at an early stage perfectly able to voice their opinions and say, hey, this is something, I think it's got a null result. I'm not going to really get it, make any progress with this. So look, let's, let's change track and do something different or related or something. I'm going to play a devil's advocate on this one a little bit because um, part of my job is also as a journalist and in journalism you often get assigned stories that you have very little interest in and you still have to do them and I found, I, I work mostly in business journalism and that wasn't something that was interesting to me at the start. I found that the writing actually is what helped me develop my interest because again writing is about storytelling and there's always a story somewhere. And if you realize that you can dig into it and you have to explain that story to someone else, you can find even, say, financial accounting, which I was assigned to write about, very interesting. So, um... You don't have to write financial accounting. Very good. Yeah. Write it. Here, if you don't want to go back and lose that year, I think the writing can save you. I don't know. I, I totally agree. I uh, deal with professional writers. Um, all the time, we have journalists in nature, and um, and to a certain extent, when when you're writing a thesis, you need to think of it as it, it's your job, and um, you know you want to do uh, put in a good effort at your job, and even if the project turns out to be not very interesting to you, you can still, as Rose said tell a good story and uh, you know sometimes it's harder well it, it will always be harder to do it than if you have a passion for it it'll be harder to get motivated but that's why the the setting yourself the writing target is good because you, you're sitting in your chair at your computer for <coughs> two three hours a day and uh, and just Making yourself do it. Hi, good question. Yeah, so, um, so there are two ways of presenting. Uh, one is to say what you have found, and another way is to say how you have found it. And I think uh, Professor Finley was saying that you know it's very important to tell the reader how you found something. You lead the reader through your story. Um, but I have also heard uh, this opinion that the reader might not be interested in how you did something, but rather is interested in what you did. So what would you say about that? Uh, who are you, please? Huh? Your, your position here? Uh, oh, uh, I'm a PhD student and I'm also a writing fellow. Uh, so I also have people in group their English, so yeah. yeah. So, so just so I understand the question was, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think uh, Klaus touched on the very beginning that you know quite often in your research you'll spend your blood, sweat and tears and put your soul into building, say, an experimental setup to make it work. But at the end of the day, of course, most readers are not interested in that. So when I say you should take the reader on a journey, I kind of meant I, I was wanting to apply a scientific journey. I don't think you should say connect part A to part B and plug that into part C and turn it on. That's not interesting because everybody can do that. So I think the method, to, to, I mean, in, in nature it's even now been kind of relegated to the method section. If you want to read about how they did it, you can read it somewhere else, but it's not part of the main narrative. The main narrative is what you did and why it's important and what the context is and this kind of thing. I think that's, the, that's what I say, what I think should be at the fore. Yeah. So not so much you know, the, the nuts and bolts of plugging thing A to B to, to make C. Um, if I may, I mean, uh, but it's still, I mean, when you say that you have to lead the reader through uh, your work so that he can think how you have thought and you can arrive at the same conclusion that you have arrived at, how can you do that without telling the reader how you did it? 
that's absolutely that's absolutely a good point. But you can, for example, without going into the details and blinding the reader with the details, you can say we can measure this parameter. If you're interested in how to do it, look in the methods section. And measuring this parameter as a function of this parameter shows this thing which tells us something fantastic. And that's that's what I mean about the hierarchy of information. There's the details, and then there's the big picture and the context. I think the big picture and the context has to come at the beginning, and the details has to come somewhere. It's in the thesis, in appendix Y or something like that. It's there. And if you want to then go back and do that experiment in the lab, you of course have to look in appendix Y to see how the person really did it. But it doesn't change the scientific argument. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting to see that uh, um, according to my observation in uh, management, um, the style of writing um, has changed and it has changed um, from, uh, I would say, at least in the German context where um, research has been presented in a way um, that you would uh, describe as how did you do your things and what did you find out and that was uh, a step-to-step -step, uh, presentation. And, um, uh, when um, our profession becomes more and more English and more and more internationally oriented, that entirely changed. And, then, uh, and now it's clear that we, uh, in the abstract, you know from the first or second sentence, uh, what did they do, what did they, fi uh, what, what did they uh, find out. And then in the introduction you read, uh, why did they do that, uh, what did they, uh, uh, what did they uh, uh, do and what did they find, find out and then you get into the details and then you can read if you would, uh, would like to read what they really did and uh, this has significantly changed. I'm not sure whether this has to do with the language. Uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen English papers that have been written in that st uh, style of what did they, uh, so uh, how, do, uh, uh, how do, uh, did they proceed and what did they fi uh, find out. Uh, but in Germany, that was quite usual. Also, the way uh, papers have been uh, structured uh, were uh, in a way that uh, you wanted to avoid, at least in a German language, to, uh, to, to repeat yourself. So uh, you told the story according to a long uh, storyline, but you don't repeat anything. Uh, my uh, doctoral advisor uh, tended to say, uh, I don't want to read uh, repetitions. Uh, I, uh, my time is uh, uh, valuable, so if I need to read uh, the abstract and then the introduction and then the, uh, the, the main section and I read uh, these things three times, then this is too much for me. But that has definitely changed. Um, and uh, research that is presented in this, as I described, this old German style um, isn't. Uh, you cannot publish that anywhere. Maybe it helps to remember also that with, we talk about storytelling, but the story doesn't start with your research. The story starts with somebody else's research far back. And so, and you can't tell the details of their experiment. So if you remember that, you're going to stay up on that higher level of the storytelling of ideas rather than, you know, I attach to A to B. Um, there's a question here. Oh, sorry. I'm Ruth from Based on your own kind of relationships with writing. 
maybe that the default can start and then he's Okay, changing my the, 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 the way of teaching and writing in my department, that's Herculean type of task. The only thing I could do is in my own environment to change it and hope maybe that somebody else will pick it up or students will communicate it. And um, so, so I have changed my attitude towards writing through the last 10 years significantly. In my industry days I didn't spend too much time on writing. Not at least on scientific writing, and uh, it was part of hobby just to take notes and diaries. But I figured out it's it's a thinking machine, and it helps do science, and it's been explained several times. And uh, so I, I adopted it as a, as part of it. And now I'm in the stage to pass on this own experience to the students. And say, I force students practically to write, and it's almost in any lecture, in any kind of a contact hour, I ask for the students to write a 50 words essay about what, is, what, what you just picked up today. Don't tell it to me, just write it down and share it with your neighbors. So I'm, I'm continuously pushing students to write. This usually leads to the fact that I start a class with 60 students and 20 out of those 60 find this boring and leave. <laughs> and then, or they don't want to be nagged all the time. But that's, so well, that, that's the price. And the 40 that left and leave, but they stay, the 40 that stay are very happy in the end. So I think, we could definitely, in, in, not just in the thesis writing, in the paper writing, it's the daily writing and formulating your own thoughts, bringing it to tape, the paper, and we could do this in small portions that are painless and it still will shape the way of thinking and working. I think that we could do. I would not dare to, 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 to propose such a thing to my department colleagues. That's kind of difficult. A little anecdote on the side, in order to emphasize this point, I'm also having this like two-day seminar course on scientific writing for the students of the graduate school. It's always overbooked. Tons of students want to participate, and I say, okay, only 12 students per semester. I can't do more than that. So I, we had a professors' meeting, and we talked about this. And then one of my colleagues was kind of making fun of my scientific writing because in his environment, they naturally learn how to write, and then. No problem, and so on and so forth. And, and he was basically making fun of me in front of my colleagues, and then I was making fun of him back. So this is very interesting and very much intrigued, my dear colleague. But just to let you know, I don't understand why three of your PhD students have been participating in my master. <laughs> comments in software and so on and so forth. So writing, and a lot of engineer students start engineering because they don't like all this language stuff. <laughs> so there's a certain, let's say, a prejudice coming along with this. Breaking this up takes a while. So back when I was uh, teaching regularly, the, I would always uh, put essay questions on homework and and exams, starting with the first year students. And uh, I felt that was very important. When I was an undergraduate, there was a project at my university where every week, um, first year students had to write about 500 words on something. We were given a, a topic on Monday, we had to turn in a draft on Wednesday morning, and we got it back Thursday in the final draft was due on Friday. And it was an interesting exercise and I really, um, I tried to force my students to, to do that. Uh, my, you know, the introductory classes have a lot of students in it and my colleagues thought I was crazy. But, you know, I felt that this was a really important thing to do. The other thing that I did was um, I made them and I always said, okay, this is going to be on the exam. So every three or four days, I told them to go out and stand in the same position at the same time and measure the length of their shadow. And then just describe what, uh, how the length of their shadow changed during the semester. 
And, and I said, you know, I'm going to ask you to describe this during, uh, uh, during the exam. And if you ever use the word because, you will get a zero. Because I want you... <laughs> It sounds very complicated, and typically this is traditionally a course which has a lot of math. It's a, a course that, it's a physicist course, so to speak, uh, and I only recommended one book for the whole course, and it was a German language book called Das Photon. Uh, and this book is the only book on the topic of photons which has only one equation in the entire book. The rest of the book is a story about the photon. And uh, anyway, the first day I gave the first lecture and I gave the reading list to the students and I got in the evening something like 20 emails from students <laughs> saying, uh, Professor Finney, you, you somehow made a mistake, we've, we've looked at this book and it only has one equation, you know, it can't be right. Uh, and I said to them, okay, well, you know, read it. Uh, and it really is to this day, there are many textbooks on this particular topic. Uh, this is by far and away the best textbook because it, it basically explains the physics without the dressing up with mathematics. And many of my colleagues would, uh, would leave the room with that statement because they consider physics to be mathematics and the language of physics is mathematics. But the language of physics is understanding the natural world and uh, that is also something that you can describe in words and not just in mathematics. So uh, this is a, my experience of this kind of, uh, this kind of Area. Think how you cleated mathematics. Yes. You didn't have formulas, you had to do it in words. Yes. We have time for one more, so you guys are going to have to talk. Right there. <laughs> There's one question back here. That's all. Uh, topic. 
And of course, there are also master, many master theses. I, I don't have statistics, but I would estimate in our faculty something of the order of 30% of the master thesis the, the side, uh, do actually end up with publications related to the work which is done in the master thesis. So I think it's, uh, I even give master theses electronically to colleagues when they visit us because they're interested in that particular topic. So it's not just documenting as an exercise, it, it, it is for us also, it's a tool we use for dissemination of research findings and the, the kind of connection between the different generations of students. Uh, in the School of Management, we have about, uh, I would say, 90% of the students that do not uh, continue with a PhD uh, after they are uh, after graduating from the ma uh, from their master studies, and they um, usually enter corporate practice somehow. And um, the, the 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 feedback that I have received from them uh, is usually um, that. I mean, not always directly after they have graduated from school, but uh, within a couple of years, they uh, also in their jobs, they need to write something. They are involved in decision making, and um, one of the key learnings uh, that they at least uh, told me is that they have learned to ask the right question, to frame the right question, to write down uh, what the question is and the answer on that. And the master thesis is uh, basically a step uh, toward, uh, towards that. Those who do their PhD usually improve their writing uh, skills uh, within their PhD uh, studies, and uh, from the PhD uh, after the PhD, you also have about 90% entering uh, corporate practice and about 10% entering the academic world. So uh, only a very limited fraction of our management students really uh, becomes an academic. But um, at least from the feedback I receive from our students, is uh, the, the feedback is that writing is so important, and what they learn during the master thesis is key for their uh, future um, professional success. Um, we do have time for a few more questions because we started late, so, um, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Simon. I teach um, at the Language Center of the Technical University of Braunschweig, and I teach mostly academic, at English for academic purposes and writing. What, you, you've talked about your own writing experiences and the importance of writing. What role do you see that writing centers or institution where there is expertise in the English language and also in the writing processes, but not in, of course, the subject-specific areas that you have expertise in. What role do you see for us in this process of teaching um, students to become competent writers? <laughs> well, as I said before, of course, it's it's, it's not the task of the writing center to be an expert in, in physics or in management or in engineering, of course, that, that's not the point. But I, I would still think, see the point of uh, getting away from the high school teaching of language, which is, it's all, it sounds kind of funny, overly academic. It's not to the point to make it as a tool. And, but teaching maybe the process of writing, everything that goes with the writing. It doesn't matter about what writing, but explore, experiencing everything we kind of mentioned, like starting early, that having a shitty first draft, how to edit the whole things, how to think about your audience, all those things. And it could be done with any type of, let's say, academic writing or not just creative writing. And that, that I think, is a, could be a valuable contribution so that students also get some guidelines on the process. So once they hit the situation of writing a master thesis, they are already somewhat familiarized with the process itself, and also with the importance of the uh, of the process. And I think, from the academic teacher side, from our side, we could also emphasize that okay, and, and pick it up the knowledge and make life easier for, for both sides. One thing that I find is still hard, and it, it just dawned on me as we talked about it: writing is one thing, but you know, writing is kind of meaningless if nobody is reading. And if I think about our class and over the hundred students, all writing essays, who's, to, who's, to, who's reading this whole thing? So it's not the task of this, of this uh, uh, writing center, but of course this is also something to be taken into account, not just the writing, but also the reading. And if I, I have to, I had to find my own fixes for this problem, but uh, it could be also helpful for the instructors, for us, to instruct on how to include 
writing and reading as an element of a curriculum development. And maybe this is something we also have to maybe overcome some bird, uh, some, some boundaries and, and talk to, to instructors as well. So there might be a multiplier for that. I wonder if you think there might be some advantage to um, non-specialists reading the students' writing as well. We're not, certainly not physicists and I think um, Steven Pinker talked about his writing, his first audience was his mother. Um, maybe we can be the first audience. Or do you think that waters down scientific writing too much? Uh, my wife reads every one of my columns, and uh, you know, while they're not overly technical, because they are aimed at uh, uh, an audience of advanced amateur astronomers, uh, you know, she comments on the writing. And I will often advise my authors who are struggling, you know, have your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife read and see how much they get from it. And see if they can convey back to you the, the essential points. They don't have to understand the details, but they ought to be able to, uh, to give you back the, you know, What's the context? What did you do? And why should anyone care? I think we have time for one last question over here. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's a very practical question that I think everyone is curious to know about, um, especially all the language teachers here. Um, a few of you mentioned <clears throat> how writing should be integrated into the curriculum at a much earlier phase and, and built in as a key element of science, regardless of your field. Um, and I think all of us have had the experience, well, I've had the same thought, um, and I've had some, some struggle with our administrations in some form or another um, in doing that and implementing that. So I'd be very curious to know, uh, I know that some of you also have experience in uh, administration, in the dean's offices, etc. Um, I'd be curious what your advice is for us when we're navigating these political decisions and curricular decisions. Um, how can we, you know, how can we push for those changes in the universities? So I'm sure the other members of the panel can comment as well. But uh, I think what is important at this stage is, of course, all the decisions in the governance structure we have in the university, they kind of start at a faculty level, and I think lobbying within the people involved in the faculty in making such decisions, the student decan and the decan, that needs to be done to, because they have to have the will to push such things forward. And I think if the student decan are, or the deans of studies are on the, if they're convinced that this is a sufficiently important development, then in that, that, that circle, they can get together and see you know, practically how could one build in more kind of writing, uh, let's say, tutoring within to the regular study programs. I, I, I actually, I agree, it's not easy because I, I also agree entirely that reading is just as important as writing. And if people get practice writing things but nobody gives them feedback and gives them this correction, and of course, I, I think all of my colleagues, if I said, okay, you're going to have 100 students sending you an essay, they'd say, okay, have fun with that, yeah, I hope you have a nice time reading those. I did, for example, in the first year I ever gave a lecture a long time ago, I wrote my email address on the board blackboard at the beginning of the lecture, and I got home, I had 120 emails in my inbox from students, yeah. So this is how you deal with the feedback, and if you don't deal with it, it's no point to do it, yeah. So I, I think, I think, my advice would be lobbying within the decision makers, within the faculties, in order to make that a little bit more proper. You, Dean. <laughs> yeah, uh, to be entirely uh, honest, I um, didn't think too much about writing and including writing in our uh, programs um, until I got the invitation here for that uh, conference. So, I entirely, um, I, I value what is happening here at home in the 
writing center, language center, uh, but uh, it was not. Uh, and, and, and I, I mean, you, I think you visited uh, me one time, but um, I just forgot that. And, <laughs> <laughs> there are so many. I, I mean, um, we, we, we are really in the process of changing our programs regularly and. It's an ongoing process and uh, we get uh, feedback from our students and from external parties that we should do more internationalization in our uh, study, uh, study programs. We should include more uh, current topics, more sustainability, more uh, so things like that. And then you struggle with uh, doing all these changes and um, changes about uh, how to include uh, or to write uh, something uh, has not at least been in. Uh, I, I haven't seen that as a top priority. So I can only encourage you to do what uh, Jonathan uh, basically said. Uh, it's uh, lobbying and it's an ongoing process, and there are some responsible persons. It's the dean and the dean of studies. We have program managers for our academic programs and uh, 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 talking to them and uh, building awareness. Um, that, that is exactly a step. I mean, this whole conference is basically also a step because uh, I, if I haven't been invi uh, invited to that conference, I even wouldn't have um, realized that this conference takes place. So uh, I think you uh, did at least uh, the, the first uh, the first steps towards uh, this objective, and I very much want to support that uh, without knowing how to do that really in. Uh, in in terms of uh, how to operate that in an ongoing context. I mean, if you want to really uh, have uh, 4,500 students, that's the number of students in our uh, department, uh, improving their writing, then I think that's a task that requires some resources as well. Maybe, maybe one practical way to go about to, because if you were as a member of a writing center, you come to a dean or other professors in the department and tell your story and say, yeah, yeah, uh, I have more important things to do than talking about writing. That's maybe a certain probability for this to happen. So maybe you can resort back to who is a key, you do storytelling. Storytelling in the sense, maybe you can pick up examples that you find within the scattered professorships about examples where writing works and make them write something about writing and share this information with people who are not yet using writing as an example. Say, so, okay, why don't you think about writing? This could bring a completely new dynamic in your class. It could maybe help you even write very inspired research proposals because you could tap into a lot of fresh minds instead of just thinking the same way all over. So I don't know exactly which pitch, but there's maybe multiple ways one could pitch experiences that are coming from professors who are already using writing as a tool. The diff difficulty might be you have to do some gem research, searching first, finding the gems and polishing them and basically take them as, as case studies, as role models and do storytelling about this. And uh, I think that might be the best case. So, oh, this is interesting, I've tried this, expose it to, this, to the colleagues, even the dean will be made aware by his colleagues or her colleagues. Uh, I had this interesting article I wrote about writing in our class, why don't we do it more? So I would I would go bottom up, not the top down. Can I add one more yes. very short thing? So I, I'm sorry, I will just I'll pass on the microphone in a second. No, you have the last word. Just picking up on that uh, uh, last week when I knew I was coming here I realized I hadn't contacted Rose so I, I wanted to find a little bit what was going to be going on here. Uh, and I, I couldn't contact Rose, but I contacted my, some of my colleagues at other universities around Germany. And I said, oh, I'm going to this kind of writing panel or something at the university. And, uh, I, and then they said, oh yeah, but do you, I said, do you give for your grad students like uh, your own little mini lecture, how to write scientific papers? And they said, yeah, yeah, I did that, I made one. And they sent me, this guy sent me a copy of his PowerPoint. And I looked and I, I made the same thing a few years ago. And then I spoke to another colleague in Braunschweig who told me he made the same thing as well. So I have the impression that all of the, the, the chairs and the groups and the research fact, they, they all do this, but it's kind of not done in a unified way. It's done independently. For some people it's probably more important than for others. Your colleague, it's not necessary, he doesn't need this. 
Yeah, but I mean, uh, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> the point is, uh, it's it's happening, but it's happening. You know, it's being taught by physicists who are not experts in academic writing. You know, I'm not an expert. I'm in here as a physicist. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a need for it, and I think lobbying and making people aware of this need, and people will pick up and say, "Yeah, we do this. We do that. We do that. We try to do that." Listen, um, thank you very much for your insights. It was incredibly interesting for me. I hope for the rest of you. Um, we'd like to invite you to join us for a glass of champagne downstairs and also to dinner at the Lemon Blau Color at 7.30. But let's have a drink downstairs first. <laughs>